Hello, I'm David Bott, Associate Director at the Institute of Positive Education here at Geelong Grammar School, Australia. Our work over the last five years has connected us with over a thousand schools around the world. Many of you have been in contact with us during this time of global crisis, and our deepest compassion and empathy goes out to those of you who are affected by the most severe consequences of this crisis. While schools in Australia and beyond continue to be faced with uncertainty, difficulty and loss, we're also witnessing so much of the human spirit at its best. One of the most fascinating aspects of the global situation is the way that schools have so rapidly risen to the challenge of remote schooling. And although we all have unique communities to serve, there is so much that we can continue to learn from each other. In this special new series, Teaching Remotely, Learning Together, we will interview leading educators from around the world as they share practical tips, strategies, resources, stories, and lessons learned from their school's experience of delivering high quality education during this pandemic. This first episode features Matt Seddon, Deputy Head of Senior School at Callet School in Hong Kong, where he's worked for the last nine years. Matt's responsible for the design and implementation of the school's pastoral system and for its world-class wellbeing program. We hope you find this conversation uplifting, useful and inspiring. So Matt, thanks for joining us. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Morning. Yeah. It's uh, interesting as I look at your backdrop there and see the the beautiful Callet School in, in your virtual background, but a little bit sad, you know, that obviously I've been to the school a couple of times and having worked with you guys over the last year or two to have been there in person, but to now not be able to see it in person is a little bit strange. How, how are you feeling in general about how things are going for you at the moment? Schools are a strange place without students. Huh? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I hope you don't mind the virtual background. I'm here in Hong Kong. Uh, our apartments are a little bit small. Um, and, and, and this sort of proofs against uh, my, my little one-year-old if he decides to run into the set. It just gives a bit of a <laughs> Nice. So, Matt, Callet uh, is now nine weeks into remote learning. Um, and I, I think, you know, in Australia today, literally today as we film this, we're doing day one in Melbourne, Victoria of our second term. Um, and it's full remote learning for, for most Victorian schools, and most Victorian teachers. So we're really at day one. You're kind of at nine weeks into all this journey. And so uh, that's why it's such an exciting opportunity for us to speak with you and just to try and learn a little bit about your experience. So if we if we start with students, can you can you tell us just one or two big lessons you've learned about the student experience? You know, what, what's it been like for them? Yeah, it's. I think we've learned a lot about our students. Um, as you say, we've been closed for nine weeks. The last day we were in school was January the twenty third, so it was actually twelve weeks ago when we did the, the different holidays. Um, I think one of the things that we've we've really learned about our students is how adaptable they are to this mm. situation. Um, Students probably have adapted quicker and easier than the staff and the parents have. They're, they're very used to the virtual world. So, so I think adaptability is, is definitely something that we've, so we've found out about our students. Um, and I guess the other thing is that they've got the ability to be far more independent than we sometimes give them credit for. Um, teachers, I think it's a worldwide thing. We're, we're by nature a little bit control freaks. And, and we love to see everything up front and done there and then. And, and perhaps we've never been forced to give them the independence that the situation has required. So yeah, incredibly adaptable, very independent students, a couple of things that we've learned. Um, yeah. yeah. And what about from a, from a well-being perspective, can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about how they fared in these first couple of months of the whole experience? Yeah. So we do, uh, we've been doing some well-being surveys, um, just, just to rag rate in one's 10 so, that, so, so they can let us know how they're doing. In generally that they, they report that they're doing pretty well. So, so, so around 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10 is what most of the students are telling us that they're doing. Um, even if they're slightly over-reporting, that's, that's not a bad situation to be in considering the length of time that they've uh, not been able to be at school. Um, of course, there are some that are uh, doing really well. There'll be some that are struggling, and we're, we're following up and working those in individual ways. But in general, they're, they're doing okay. Um, I think one of the big things that they've really told us um, and they've really been crying out to us is that how important it is the, to feel connected. So, so that's a, a really important part of their well-being so we've really tried to focus in on uh, in different ways. The connectivity has been a thing that they've struggled with the most. Yeah. And what have, what have you done to try and help them manage that effectively? Um, 
as much as we can, really. I think one, one of the first questions I think all schools will ask is, of course, how do we keep learning going? How, how do we, we keep the education going? How do we teach maths? How do we teach science? How do we teach English? Um, one of the decisions we took really early on was that um, tutor time, we, we call it tutor time. I think, do you, do you call it homeroom time or, or similar? Tutor time here, similar, yeah, yeah. Home is good. So, so we kept the tutor time going um, from day one. Um, and we really prioritized that in the day and, and created half an hour every day where we got the, the tutor group together. Um, not necessarily with any agenda, just to be together online and, and to speak with the form tutor. If there was things on their mind about the virus and the, the pandemic, we'd talk about that. Or maybe we'd talk about nothing at all. Or maybe there'd be a quiz from the form tutor or, or something fun to just lighten the load. And I think that was a really important decision that we took very early on, which um, has paid dividends because the students really just value being together um, in that way. Yeah. I think it's, it's such an important point, isn't it, that being together. And I, I think what we're recognising about schooling is that um, in, in many ways, you, you, know, you can learn to read and write at home with parents. You can learn algebra at home, but you that socialisation, the connectedness that is such a kind of, you know, uh, intricate, in, important, um, uh, fundamental part of schooling, we, we, we take that for granted a fair bit. And I, th I think um, w what's happening online is a recognition that we have to do something really active to ensure that students have the opportunity to connect some way at least. So, yeah, so yeah. It's, I love that you're approaching that in that way. I completely agree. And I think actually what you just said is, is one of the most important things. You, you can learn maths online. You don't need to come to school to learn maths. It's perfectly mm. good websites that can teach you maths. Mm. Um, what, what is it that makes a school more than a series of online learning resources? And it's all that connectivity, the community side of things that comes together. The student wants to learn from the maths teacher because of the relationship they've got with the maths teacher. That, that, that's so much more than any amazing website or resource that you can you can put in front of them and, and for us that's been a, a real key that, that personal side of how we get people working together yeah. is part of what's making a difference great tell us a little bit about the from a, the teacher's perspective and the, the whole teaching experience again what, what have you learned in the first couple of months about the experience of being a teacher delivering remote learning and, and also the experience of delivering content you know trying to teach kids online tell us about your experience through that uh yeah it's hard. It's, it's, it's really, really hard. I think one of the, um, it, it's really important to recognize that it takes much, much longer to prepare an online lesson than it does a lesson in the classroom. Whether that is um, setting up the resources and the way you can do the feedback, or whether that's uh, pre recording, um, some sort of screencast, or something, it just takes a lot longer. So it's been really important that um, we as teachers are looking out for each other and recognizing that and understanding that. Um, and, and working together in collaborative ways so that we're not all working in silos. Um, our leadership team took the decision quite early on that this was likely to be a long-term thing, not a short-term thing. And so while it was still safe to do so, we got staff in working together in the early days. Um, and, and, and that was perhaps not a popular decision, first of all, but I think looking back on it, most staff would recognise what, what a good thing that was enable the teams to come together, enable the different teaching groups to, to upskill each other. Teachers were, were really um, pushing each other professionally to, to develop and leaders in different fields soon emerged who, who the go-to person was to speak to uh, different mm -hmm. things. And, and what we saw was a, was a staff who were um, really uh, just learning new things and, and in, in perhaps a, a rapid learning curve they'd not had for, for many, many years. It's really yeah. fascinating to see how that worked. And, yeah, and it was I'll, prompt at first, actually. It just happened. Sure. Yeah, and obviously all of the technical side of things is is one element and then there's the, the practical delivery of content. And as you say, reshaping your whole pedagogy to deliver content um, is very different in a, in a remote setting. So you have to think about all of that. Um, but fascinating to see how people stepped up and helped contribute and helped other faculty helped other faculty other staff members learn through all of that yeah. as well. But it must have been a very steep learning curve for, for some teachers, I imagine. It, a huge learning curve for everybody and mm -hmm. um, I think for some people they're really out of their outside of their comfort zones and I think it's really important to recognize that and, and for other people they were really uh, digitally savvy and, and really ready to just uh, embrace everything and I think yeah. that, that was great but we always need to bring it back to uh, I think that relationship between the teacher and the student right. the, the technology was the facilitator the technology is the, the tool that we're able to use and and there's 
educational companies all over the world are, are looking to give free resources and, and that's fantastic we're really grateful for for everything they've been sent our way but actually the core thing is the teacher and the student and that's the, that's been the most important thing and using the tech to facilitate that relationship and, and to enable the lessons to continue yeah. rather than it being about the technology yeah sure and what about the, from a well-being perspective, again, for, for the teachers, how, how have they gone? And, and maybe if you could speak um, kind of chronologically, I guess, uh, starting from the initial couple of days and couple of weeks through to the, the middle stage of your experience now through to nine weeks later, what's it been like for the well-being of teachers? I, I, I imagine it's hard to, you've got to speak in general, generalities a little bit, and obviously everybody's a little bit different, but yeah. it just gives your overall perspective on what it's been like from a well-being perspective for teachers. And I think you're right when you say, of course, everybody's situation is completely different. Um, teachers have gone through a roller coaster and continue to go through a roller coaster. And we've talked a little bit about um, false peaks, where, where you think the end is in sight and you're, and you're on your way back down, and then there's another peak. So at first, we were closed for two weeks, and everyone was like, we're just going to get through these two weeks. And then it became four weeks, and it became six weeks. Now it's that they're closed indefinitely. So at those key times when there were announcements made from the government that, that it was continued, there was some big emotional drops. Um, teachers, uh, as you know, invest their heart into this and, and they're really committed to everything they're doing. And, and those those moments really hit people um, and, and, and really took a, a downward turn at those points. But the teachers are also doing amazing stuff to keep each other's spirits high. Um, uh, gym classes that were made available, well-being initiatives where we were... Um, staff football, staff volleyball, staff badminton, what whilst we were still able to get together. Um, there did come a point where the, the, the virus situation got worse here in Hong Kong and we're now currently working from home, we're no longer. So, so that took a, a hit to the staff sports, which were really popular, but we've responded in, in different ways. So we're now doing uh, staff quizzes online so we can come together in different ways and just um, try and keep that community going, I think is the important yeah. thing. And what about the, I imagine there must be a, a number of your teachers who are struggling more than others. Have you been able to identify them early and if so what have you done to support those teachers yeah I think um, so same as with the students so we've been doing uh, a staff, staff well-being survey which enabled uh, at a confidential level the well-being team to, to know who was struggling and to reach out to them in, in very different specific and personal ways exactly the same as we've been doing with the students really just just trying our best to understand everybody's situation which is completely different if you're, if you're living on your own if you've got a family at home um, if you're struggling to work and with the children, um, size of apartment, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things, every different situation. So we're just trying to do what we can when we can. Um, and I think just keep checking in with each other. And, and I think that's the important thing, just keeping that open communication going. Yeah. Um, and in, ter in terms of, uh, great to hear that you've been uh, actively, I think, measuring, trying to measure well-being to keep track of general well-being, but also identify some people that might be struggling. Can you give us any any uh, any tips or strategies for how you've managed students, or specifically handled any student issues that have arisen, um, or, or is your data not uh, identifiable enough? So, or so, tell us a little bit about how you've tried to identify real students at risk, and then how you've tried to uh, specifically deal with that. Yeah, I mean, there's. The thing with well-being issues is there's there's no textbook. It's not a it's not a a mathematical equation. Everything is on a case by case situation. So there's there's so many different situations. If you've got a school refuser um, who who doesn't like coming to school in the first place, this is this is their you know this is their favourite way to be. They suddenly don't need to come to school. They can work at home. So that provides a very different challenge. And um, you've got children perhaps whose parents are in different countries um, been separated by this. And that's, that's a very real thing. All sorts of things going on. And, and I wouldn't even know where to begin. But I think the important thing is, um, is, is identifying them and, and having the team in place to do that. So we actually have um, a fantastic team of our, our former tutors and our heads of house. Um, our heads of house actually have phoned every family in the house. So that was something we did really early on. It was really important to try and get into their shoes and understand what everyone was going through. So we, we just cleared out time for this team to just pick up the phone one by one and ring everybody in their house group and just try to get a feel for what the uh, the challenges that they were facing were and, and you know, case by case, what can we do to support, if anything. Sometimes there's lots, sometimes there's nothing, but you know, just trying to understand them. I think making that time has been a... A really, a really important thing for us to do. 
Let me just dig into that phone call just a little further. So you talked about house groups, uh, which is a, a pastoral um, group, I guess, of students. Firstly, how big is that group and how often are those phone calls, being, how often are families being contacted by members of the, of the pastoral care staff? Yeah, so, so a house group is, is around 150 students. Mm. So we split them into, into that of all ages from, from, from 11 years old through to 18, talking about the senior school here. It's different in our primary school. And so, yeah, we did that um, in the first couple of weeks. It was try, to try within two to three weeks to try and reach out to every family in our, in our community and, and to try and understand that. Focus then shifted a little bit to our examination students. So there's a lot of questions and, and stresses that were coming. How are the GCSEs? How are the A-levels? Um, what's going to happen there? Of course, the exams ended up being cancelled and, and we're now going through the support with that. But particularly then it was again about phoning all of those families, talking through them and um, just providing that personal reassurance, I think was, was really important. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's a great concept. And I, I think many schools around the world at the moment, including schools, uh, our own school and schools around us in Melbourne, Victoria and, and Australia and internationally are, are really grappling with this concept of how do we best provide that personal connection, personal support. And so I think, you know, what Callot did in the early days, picking up the phone, contacting, regularly contacting families is, is such an important part of that. So thanks for sharing. Um, Matt, I'd love to ask you this question. Um, if you could go back in time to November 2019 before COVID began, um, what advice would you give yourself or your school that might help with where we are now? Uh, it's, it's actually a perfectly uh, timed question because we can go back in time to November 2019 and look back at it because Hong Kong has actually had a really bad year. Hong Kong was hit by the civil unrest and the protests that government started in July um, and, and it continued all the way through to January. And actually November was a, was a really key time. In November, our school was shut down for seven days, um, spanning across two weeks uh, because it just wasn't safe to come to school. So we had to... Have, had to get our home learning policies really uh, reviewed and, and in place and ready to respond um, to that situation, which in a, in a really uh, unfortunate way prepared us very well for the COVID situation. So it meant that we've really been forced to look into everything there and think about how that we are going to provide home learning and our support. So there have been no excuses really if we weren't ready to go um, when this hit. Of course, what we planned for when we were talking about home learning was short-term home learning, a day's worth of disruption, two days, maybe a week's worth of disruption and how we would do that. What we weren't thinking was that we might be shut since January the 23rd, um, which of course is, is a completely different thing, how you, how you can manage in the short term versus how you can manage in the long term. Um, and going back to this idea of how it takes a lot longer for teachers to prepare a, a virtual lesson, the same is true, um, we found, for students as well. So an hour in the classroom takes a lot longer at home. So the model that we moved to was, um, was mirroring the school day. You would have maths when you would normally have maths, you would have English when you would normally have English. What we found was that by trying to mirror the school day, which ran from 8 through to 3, actually went from 8 through to 5 or 6 by the time that the students had had the work because it was just taking longer. Um, so, so one of the things that we'd, to go back to your original question, what would we wish we'd known was exactly that, that, that an hour at home is not the same as now in the classroom. So as a result, we've, we've really taken a conscious decision to, to make the lesson shorter. 50-minute um, lessons have become 40-minute lessons. We've squashed the day, if you like, so that, that the, the online learning part is completed by lunchtime, and then after lunch you have the freedom to, to, to mop up any bits that you need to do, any independent learning needs to go with it, or to go for a run, or, or to get some exercise, or, or to do any of the family activities, because mm. it's just not healthy for people to try and keep that going through to five, six o'clock in the evening. Mm. So, tell, what, why is it? Why does it take so much longer to learn online from a student perspective? Why does it? Why, why have you found that's the case? What, is, what are the factors contributing to that? <laughs> I, I, I don't know actually I don't I wouldn't know where to begin with that I think it's just uh, the environment you, you're suddenly you're not in a school environment with your, your classmates sat next to you. Um, you you've got family around you've got have you got a quiet desk um, your teacher although they might be there on the video chat with you isn't there with you I think everything just takes that little bit longer and I think appreciation of that is really important for everyone to mm -hmm. 
it's not a very satisfactory answer. I, I don't know why, but it, it just takes longer. Mm -hmm. And so, you, so you've squashed the day, as you said, uh, into the, the front end of the day, which makes sense. And there's freedom in the afternoon to do all sorts of things. What, t tell us a little bit about homework and how, how you've approached that with, with senior students. Yeah, so we, we work on year seven, eight and nine, which is our 11 year olds, 12 year olds, 13 year olds. For those guys, we said no homework. Mm -hmm. um, we, we felt that they're already at home and they're already working at, at the end of their capacity to do so so we're not setting any additional homework on top of that for examination students that's slightly different um they've got um preparation for university to get ready for and all sorts of things so so where appropriate that's that's still able to continue and i think the um the condensed format of the day has supported us to be able to do that nice yeah thank you obviously during this time matt you and the leadership team are making decisions on the fly. You know, it's, it's a, a very reactive environment that we're in necessarily because of uh, the changes that are occurring day, day on, day in, day out. Um, and you've explained maybe going back to 2019 what you might have done differently or, or sooner. But can you, can you give us an example of a decision that you really got right, one where you kind of went with your gut feel or you used data or you made an informed decision that was really right at the time and it and has played out in a really effective way? Yeah, I think the, the biggest one we already discussed actually was the tutor time. Uh, so making that additional time for, for, for the community to just get together and, and have that one-to-one -one support from the former tutor. I think um, that's proven to be invaluable. I think one of the other things that um, the phone calls enabled, which, which was one of the other things we talked about, is for us to try and be, in everything we do, uh, really empathetic. That, that's probably one of the biggest decisions we made really early on, is to understand that everybody's situation is completely different from students through to staff, through to parents. You've got people um, who are losing their jobs. You've got people who are in high stress situations away from their family. Um, as best as we can, how can we try to understand the situation they're in? How can we um, make allowances for that? Everything's not black and white. There's, there's no black and white answer to anything here. There's, mm. there's the whole spectrum. So really a focus on empathy in terms of our decision making and our communications. Um, we really tried hard to to just understand. You know, if, if you're a parent and you've taken the decision that you don't want your child to do any learning today, that, that's absolutely your right and your responsibility as a parent. You're the primary educator of your child. Um, we're here to, to facilitate and, and to provide opportunities to, to enrich the learning in the home environment. But the parents got that decision first and foremost. And, and I think one of the things we really wanted to do was to understand that and, and to to support families in making decisions that were right. Mm. Have you used any other, in terms of getting feedback more from parents or allowing them to be have a voice in the decision-making processes, have you used any other strategies or intentional devices to try and ensure that parents' voices are loud and strong? And I appreciate that Calit's an unusual school in a sense in that your your board, your governing body is, is made up of entirely of parents, um, yeah. which many schools are not like that. Um, but outside of that governance board, um, what, what processes have you used to ensure that there's a strong parent voice and maybe also a student voice as well? So, so certainly the student voice, part of the reasons for the, um, the tutor time was for us to be able to hear very quickly what's going well and what's not. Um, it provided a really informal opportunity for everything to be fed back up to the curriculum areas and the leadership teams and for us to proactively go and think about how we can do that better. So that was a really great way of student voice in addition to student surveys. So we, we did that informally and formally, informally with the tutor and formally through, um, through surveys. From a parent perspective, you're quite right, we, we have our board of governors who are parents, but we also have very active parents committee. And... Um, each class or each year group has um, a, a volunteer member who is part of our parents committee and, and who are really active um, advocates of the school and community members. So, so I've been speaking with those and, and many other members of our leadership team have been speaking with our parents and, and that's been a really helpful way, two ways of, of us hearing from their perspective. Um, if there was an issue, if there was concern, it was enabling us to respond in a certain way but it was controlled that way because it came through the parents committee 
um, rather than it being uh, the best part of a thousand different voices with a thousand different opinions. They were able to really, um, really collect feelings and say this, this is a, a collective feeling on this issue and we'd really like to listen on this. So that's been really helpful. It also allows us um, the other way to get messages out to the community and it, and it might be um, WhatsApp and social media and, and so forth so quick to react to certain things and, and it might be that you've heard this school has done this or this school has done that and, and being the first to make a decision doesn't always make it the right decision. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes it's really important to, to, to sit back and reflect and consider everything and the parents committee have been equally um, as invaluable when those situations have occurred for us to just be able to pick up the phone and say hey listen I know that you've heard XYZ just so that you know we're, we're considering all the different elements of it anything you can do in the background to just help support us to just while we make this decision so that we come to the right decision for our community is going to be really helpful in this situation. It's, it's certainly not that we're not aware or not that we haven't made a decision yet. It's just that we're, we're taking our time to get that right. Yeah. And I love that all those communication channels are so important. Um, I've also appreciated and been keeping a um, close eye on some of the other strategies that Callet School has been using to try and maintain the well-being of the whole community and some of your uh i know you've been writing a little bit about this in the in the in the times education supplement and i know um that your head of school mark has also been writing quite a lot about this but uh, a cu couple of the little practical tips strategies that you've been that you can share with us about that you've intentionally gone out of your way to you know to try and keep the well-being buoyant to try and ensure that people are staying connected. Um, you know, one of them was the the gratitude uh, letters that you uh, tell us a little bit about the gratitude letter uh, experiment. Yeah, yeah, we we um we invited all of our students to write a, a letter of gratitude to their teachers or their, or their form tutors or anyone that they they thought would particularly help them through the the home learning. We did this on the, on the secret actually. We didn't tell uh, the teachers that this was happening, so the, the students would write. Uh, received an invitation to, to fill that in online and we collated it at the back end and did a mail merge and um, on the first day of the, the Easter break we uh, we sent all those letters out to the, the teachers it was pretty emotional for the teachers to to hear that firsthand from the students and for the students they, they wrote some really thoughtful things and that, that's where they really um, had the opportunity to show how much they valued their teacher and for the teachers to hear that I think it it was a really nice thing. It worked really well. So that, that was just a very simple concept, but the, the technology enables to bring that together in a really nice way. Um, open so yeah, mic competition? Really, yeah, open mic. We've, we, we've, we've been running a series of uh, Feel Good Fridays for about three or four years now. Um, they're uh, part of our pos -ed strategy and the way that we can just get some practical way, ways into our community. And, and so we had an open mic uh, session where the students were, were singing and the staff just singing some songs together online from wherever they were in the world. Um, so we did that virtually uh, through, through YouTube Live. Um, did you have, you had a go? What was, your, what was your track? What did you go yeah, through? Yeah, uh, Be Bex, Bex, my wife and I, we did a duet and we sang um, Billy Eilish um, song, which was really nice. Very nice. Ocean Eyes. We sang Ocean Eyes. <laughs> <Very Yeah. nice. laughs> uh, and I love both, you know, in their fun kind of, you know, the gratitude one is a bit more serious, I guess, a bit more intentional and really well yeah. thought through. The other one's kind of a bit more fun and just almost flippant op opportunities to get together and have a laugh at ourselves and each other. I think both of those are important for schools to consider. Um, but clearly your school has been very deliberate about trying to look for opportunities to connect to generate positive emotions, to generate, you know, to, to keep relationships strong. Um, you know, so I think, I think it's important to think about the more serious, really well thought through strategic opportunities to provide well-being support, but also the little fun, you know, almost informal, off-the-cuff experiences. I think they're really fun as well. And I think schools that we're working with around the world that are doing this or going through this experience really effectively, I, I think are considering both of those elements. So, um, so I appreciate that, Matt. Can you give us some... Um, uh, a particular, I know you guys have also been looking at, at external resources and podcasts and books and websites for your parents and students and teachers. Give us any little particular resources that you have found really valuable that other people might enjoy reading or looking at. Yeah, um, I think um, for the students' perspective, we, we, we've been using the PEAK curriculum for, for a year and a half now, I think. So it's been uh, really well received that you're now doing the weekly um, 
version for the home learning. So that's, that's been a fantastic thing that we can get out into our students. Makes it really easy for them to access them in a quick way. So that's, that's been really appreciated. Thank you for that. Um, for, for teachers, one of the things that I've been really enjoying, uh, Dr. Jared Cooney Horvath is doing a series um, from theory to practice, which is where he's reading uh, research documents and, and summarizing them into really succinct four or five minute videos uh, so that you don't have to do all the heavy reading. That's been a fantastic um, thing for us teachers who are really busy at the moment. We know we're working long into the night, but some really great tips that have just been really nicely presented. So if you've not seen that, I'd recommend having a look at those. They're fantastic. Um, for parents, do you know what? I, would, I, I actually wouldn't give any tips at all. I, I wouldn't want to do that. I think the most important thing parents can be doing at the moment is spending time with their family, spending time with their children. Of course, they've got work stresses and, and, and considerations that go with that, but Taking every uh, every opportunity to just be with your family, I think, is the best thing, the most important thing parents can do. If you're musical, play music together with your kids. If you're arty, draw together, paint together. If you're sporty, exercise together. I think mm -hmm. that would be the best advice I'd give to parents. Yeah, just just do, you know, in this together, I think is is a pretty healthy mentality to have around this. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Matt. L love it. Thank you very much. Um, we're getting towards the end of our, our time together. Just a couple of more, a couple of more final questions, Matt. Um, firstly, if we put it, project ourselves into the future, and whether that's six months or twelve months, eighteen months, um, to a point beyond the pandemic and beyond all of the challenges we're facing, um, do you think Kellett will return to normal? Do you think it's changed forever? Um, and how, how do you? How, what's it going to be like on the flip side of this for you at Kellett? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that I can really remember what normal was like anymore. It feels it feels so longer. Will it will it return? I I, I think yeah. I think um, schools have been realising for a long time that that, that that an outstanding school, world class school, an excellent school needs to be more than a series of lessons, and there's so much more to that. And I think um, we were already uh, already thinking in that way, and and have been for many years, and. The community side of things is what's going to keep schools going. I think that's, that's so different for online learning. So, so I really do believe, yes, schools are going to have to adapt, but schools will return to a, a form of normality. But will it be the same? I, I think everything's changed. I think it's forcing us to think in different ways. Um, and I think we're only just starting to begin to understand what those might be. Um, if you look at all the new skills that, that staff have had through recording uh, podcasts or screencasts. I, I think that's going to probably have a big impact on classroom in the future. Um, they're building up this bank of resources and, and it's probably going to encourage and enable flip learning to happen in a, mm. in, in a way that we've not fully embraced in schools before. Students can go home for their homework and, and hear the podcast on the poem or on, on the text that they're studying and they can come to school and, and, and have the skills from pick that together. I think, I think that way of flip learning is going to perhaps be more embraced. I think it's going to change the practical way um, that we think about many things like through to study support when, when students are up from their exams. Do they need to come in to see the teacher in order um, to, to get help on that question? Well, I think we're much more confident with video technology and video learning how to use that safely now. I think that's going to change the way we do study support in those exam periods. And, and where to even begin with the wider picture of education um mm. the ib exams were cancelled the gcse is an a level the curriculum around british um the british system has been cancelled and, and all of a sudden the teachers are being asked to make a judgment on on how well and to make an assessment on how well that student has learned and all of a sudden we're, mm. we're now really trusting the teacher's professional opinion to do that and i think that's going to force a real question back onto the purpose of exams which mm. um People all over the world have been questioning for many, uh, for many years the pressure, the stress that it puts students under, whether it's the most appropriate way to be assessing students learning in the year 2020. Well, this, this is going to force that question because we're going to have a whole, whole generation of students going through to university who didn't sit those exams mm -hmm. and are still going to university very well educated, having completed all the learning they needed. So I think that's a really exciting opportunity. Um, I've no idea where it's going to go, but it's, I think it's an exciting conversation to be a part of. 
Matt, thank you so much. Uh, fascinating to hear your views and all that. And I think so much insight um, about what's currently occurring, what's going to unfold for us. And very grateful that you've been able to, firstly, grateful you, that you're two months ahead of us and are able to kind of help us understand what we might be um, about to experience here in Australia. Um, very grateful for your time. Thank you so much. You're always so generous in your sharing. Um, appreciate that uh, it's a very, very busy time for you at Cal at School. Um, and all the work you're doing is, is, is awesome there as well um, and, and just really appreciate your willingness to share with others as well. If people want to learn, find out more about what's going on at Callet or about what you're thinking, I know you're writing, I know you, um, you're relatively active on social media, what's the best place for people to follow your work or Callet's work? Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I don't know if you're able to share the links, um, how, how we're going to distribute this video, very happy for people to contact me by email or to, or to reach out to, to our school, a LinkedIn page. Um, We've really taken the opportunity that um, we believe it's our responsibility to, to share with everybody because we have been doing this for longer, as we say, since November. Um, we really feel that that's the right thing to do. So, as you say, Mark has written a load of articles for school leaders um, that they're really, um, I think there's a series of seven of them now, which are really worth a look at, all covering different aspects from finance through to well-being, through to, to to, to staff morale and all sorts of things so we're happy to share anything um, just just reach out and, and any questions um, if we can do we're really really hopeful that something that we've gone through will be helpful to, to, to somebody who's just a beginning the journey. Matt thank you so much always a, a pleasure and a privilege to talk with you and to, to learn more about Cal at School thank you again so much for your time stay well and we'll, we'll keep in touch. Thanks David you too. Cheers mate. Mm -hmm.